When three men from Perth, Australia left on their catamaran on April 15, 2007, little did the world know their voyage, or lack of one, would become a mystery that would embroil the curious and lead to numerous theories of what happened to them in their boat, the Kaz-2. Think back to April 15, 2007. Think about what you were doing. Perhaps you went to work or school? Maybe you took a trip, possibly on a boat. What would be a wonderful day for an aquatic adventure for three residents of Western Australia would end up as a wonderful day for a tragedy? Derek Batten and brothers Peter and James Tunstead left Airlie Beach, Queensland on Sunday, April 15, 2007 in an effort to reach Townsville, Queensland as part of a voyage taking them around Northern Australia. Nothing seemed off or out of sorts until the Kaz-2 was spotted drifting aimlessly near the famous Great Barrier Reef by a helicopter on Wednesday, April 18th. The helicopter reported the sighting, worried the crew could potentially be in distress. Unfortunately, a team was only able to reach the Kaz-2 on Friday, April 20th. When the 40-foot catamaran was boarded, the potentially distressed crew was anything but. In fact, they weren't anything at all. There was no one aboard the Kaz-2. The rescue team was perplexed to find that nothing looked wrong inside the boat. The engines, computers, a laptop, and the radio were all reported to be working fine. A meal was prepared and utensils laid out, ready to be used. Why, then, was the crew absent? Derek Batten was not unaccustomed to the seas, as he had previously sailed the Kaz-2 around the area a few times with his wife. Peter and James Tunstead were not new to sailing either, as they had been sailing together since their late teens. The man that sold Mr. Bat and the Kaz-2 even helped plan the course for the men with the aid of computers and a GPS. How did these men, not at all inexperienced, end up missing? There are several theories present, and we'll start with the official explanation with the established facts before getting into the wilder theories or my own opinion. It was Friday, April 20th, that the Kaz-2 was towed into port at Townsville for forensic examination ironically completing that leg of the journey without any involvement of the original crew. The next day, Saturday, April 21st, the ship was searched by two sergeants with the Queensland Police for signs of foul play or outside involvement, although no such evidence was found. The sergeants observed that the cabin was well kept apart from a few loose items which were later established to have been due to the Kaz 2's towing. Nothing else was disturbed, including the handgun and ammunition that Mr. Batten had in a sealed container under his bunk. Outwardly, however, it was noted that one of the sails was badly mangled and the boat's fenders were out. The police next examined the data from the boat's GPS, which showed that it was headed northeast towards an area where rough seas were forming. Later that day, the GPS showed Kaz-2 adrift. Video footage was recovered, the last of which was taken on the day of the trip, April 15th. In the footage, Derek Batten can be seen at the helm while Peter Tunstead is fishing at the aft. The engine is not running and the fenders are hanging from the sides of the boat. None of the men are wearing their life jackets, and the seas are seen to be choppy. A sure recipe for possible disaster, even for the most experienced of sailors. A search had been initiated on April 18th, conducted by Australian Search and Rescue via Navy Aircraft and Bowen Voluntary Marine Rescue. They searched the reefs, caves, the coast, and nearby islands, but no trace of the crew of the Kaz-2 was found. The search resumed the following day, aided by the Volunteer Rescue Association, or VRA, and the Townsville Coast Guard. Fielding two helicopters, nine planes, and two commercial vessels, the search party used the GPS data to narrow down the search area to no avail. A survival expert that was consulted concluded that the men were likely no longer alive if they had indeed been in the water for the past three or four days. At this point, hope was all but lost. With the lack of bodies since the disappearance of the crew of the Kaz-2, theories have been plentiful. One of the more outlandish theories relates to the boat's fenders being down, leading some to believe it had been docked with another ship and the men had simply gotten onto said other ship either willingly or unwillingly, perhaps. Proponents of the piracy or similar crime theory, including Hope Hyming, the niece of Derek Batten, claim that there would be no reason for the fenders to be out unless the Kaz-2 planned to come aside another boat or a port. This, however, was argued against by Townsville police who said that some small craft leave their fenders out at all times, leaving the theory, if you'll forgive the expression, dead in the water. 
Another theory states that the Kaz-2 became grounded on a sandbar near their last known location, George Point, and the men got out to push the ship free when a gust of wind blew the ship away. This theory, at least in my opinion, doesn't deserve detailed attention. It seems highly unlikely that the men would disembark the boat and attempt to free it when they have perfectly functioning equipment to radio for assistance. Again, I don't think this theory holds any... water. Why would a seemingly devoted husband decide to disappear, especially on a trip that originally involved his wife? Why would James Tunstead, a man who loved his boat so much he is said to have a framed picture of it on his kitchen table, abandon it to the seas? Why would his brother go along with it? All were happy family men. It makes no sense that these three men would want to just up and disappear at the same time. Much of what we know about the disappearance of Derek Batten and the Tunstead brothers comes from an inquest into the incident started by the Townsville Coroner's Court and led by Queensland State Coroner Michael Barnes. It is his explanation of the events of April 15th that are regarded as the most plausible. Indeed, the conclusion that Mr. Barnes arrived at is the conclusion we will go into the most detail of, as I personally believe it is what occurred. A fact that is often glossed over is the voyage was to begin on April 14th, the day before. GPS troubles forced the group to return soon after they left. It was reported by the Sydney Morning Herald that the police said user error was to blame for the GPS not working correctly. The route planned on the laptops found in the boat was to take the Kaz-2 through the Whitsunday Passage around George Point and past Bowen where it would spend the night close to air, 90 kilometers south of the destination of Townsville. The last known contact with the Kaz-2 was on the 15th around 6.45 p.m. with the position listed as George Point. Karen Gray, the daughter of James Tunstead, told the Sydney Morning Herald in the same report that the trip from Airly Beach to George Point should only take roughly two and a half hours. That means that from 8 a.m., the departure time according to the Herald report, to 6.45 p.m., the time of last recorded contact, the Kaz-2 was somewhere between Airly Beach and George Point. A two and a half hour journey had become a near 11 hour journey. Knowing what we know about the previous GPS troubles faced by the men on the Kaz-2, in my opinion, it's likely that they went off course at some point, explaining the time discrepancy. In the official report, a fishing line tangled on the portside rudder is said to have led to one of the Tunsteads, possibly James due to him taking off his shirt and glasses, attempting to free it. He probably fell into the water while trying to get the line free as he was standing on a particularly dangerous part of the boat very close to the water. The other brother then likely attempted to rescue him as Mr. Batten started the engine and went to drop the sails. While en route, wind or some other force could have caused the boom to knock Mr. Batten into the water. At this point, all three men would have been in choppy water, and the boat was already traveling before wind. Kaz-2 would have left its crew in the water in seconds, according to the report. At this point, sailing experience would mean nothing. If this is what actually happened that day, the fates of the crew were sealed as soon as they hit the water. The report then concludes they, not being good swimmers and the water being so treacherous, would have grown exhausted and inevitably drowned. So, at the end of the day, what do I think happened to the Kaz-2? As I said, I think that the report by the coroner, Michael Barnes, is, in all likelihood, actually what happened to the Kaz-2. It's perfectly believable to assume that maybe it was just a mistake. Maybe one of the Tunsteads was where he shouldn't have been, he fell overboard, and his brother being a good brother. I mean, think of it. If that was your brother that just fell into the water, you would go rescue him, wouldn't you? I think that the other Tunstead, the one that wasn't quite in the water yet, attempted to help his brother, and then Mr. Bat and these being two of his friends, two of his good friends, he wanted to help them as well, as any friend would, or as any decent person would. It was this desire to help the man that fell overboard, at least if you believe in the coroner's version of the story, this desire is what ultimately doomed all three men on the Kaz-2, and in a way, doomed the Kaz-2 itself. If Mr. Batten had not went to drop the sails, he had not left the controls of the boat, he had stayed in there, 
there's a good chance that he might have at least been able to drop an anchor or do something to go back and help the two Tunsteads that were in the water. Even being less than good swimmers, if you believe the reports, they should have at least been able to tread water until Mr. Batten could have got back to them or thrown them a life preserver or something. In fact, it was even said that the Kaz-2 had a smaller boat attached to the rear of the boat. So you'd think maybe he could drop the boat? Uh, there's so many things about this story that, if you think about it, it really makes sense. I know this is one of those things, like the Mary Celeste of Australia. This is one of those things that people like to think about. They like to put too much thought into. They like to assume. And in a way, it's kind of messed up to be throwing all these accusations out about piracy and new lives starting over. All these crazy theories about a tragedy where three men died on a simple boating trip, something that they had done, all of them had done before with moderate success, in fact, great success. When I was going over the information for this video, I read that the wife, in the testimony for this, this inquest they did in 2008, his wife said, the Mr. Batten's wife, excuse me, Mr. Batten's wife said that all the previous trips they'd taken in the CAS-2 went just fine. Everything was perfect, other than maybe one issue with the rudder, if I remember correctly. The man that sold Mr. Batten the CAS-2 said that the boat was in perfectly good working condition. The guy even helped plan their route, and when he was told that they had deviated from that route, he seemed really surprised, like they had deviated from the course of the GPS. And I also read that the GPS issue that they had originally when they attempted to leave on April 14th, well, that wasn't really so much a big issue as it was a simple fix, and after that they were good to go. But how then did they end up so lost? They were in the general vicinity, it was like 2 kilometers or something, or 20, some decent number of kilometers away from their destination, but certainly within sailing range, especially for three accomplished sailors. They were in the area. One of the daughters said maybe they were fishing, you know, maybe they had just been fishing for that entire almost 11 hours that they were adrift somewhere between Airlie Beach and George Point. I guess what you could say at the end of the day is, as fun as it is to speculate about stuff like this, even though it's a little morbid that we're speculating and throwing all these crazy theories about, like, aliens, I didn't even include the alien theory in this, and it's because I don't want to. I think that's just insulting. I don't consider myself to be very sensitive, but three men died, mysteriously. There were never any bodies for their families to bury, so there was really no closure. It just seems kind of... dark, I guess, to say that aliens abducted these guys, or some Australian pirates picked them up. It's not like they were sailing off the coast of Somalia. There was really no reason to assume that anybody had any kind of hand in their disappearance. I think people read too much into it. I think people get too caught up in the mystery and they want to believe that there's something mysterious about this. Much like how people want to believe that the Bermuda Triangle, which we may eventually end up covering, they want to believe that kind of stuff exists and it happens, but in all realism, the most likely theory is the men just happen to maybe make a mistake and they were concerned about their friends and this led to them accidentally being knocked overboard or at least Mr. Batten being accidentally knocked overboard. So at the end of the day I think we can chalk this one up to a tragedy a tragedy that never should have happened but the tragedy did happen and unfortunately these three men died or at least that's what we think because with no corpses there's really no guarantee could they have potentially faked their own death and went off to live somewhere else? Sure. Maybe. Hell, maybe it was aliens. You just, you really don't know. So I thank everybody for listening to this video. It was a blast to make. I had a lot of fun doing the research for this one. I had a lot of fun recording it. I hope everybody enjoyed it, and who knows, maybe I'll see you guys back for another episode. Until then, everybody stay curious. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Thank you.